How much is enough? How much money? How much land? How many possessions or prizes or accomplishments? How many houses and cars? How many experiences? How much food? At what point do we become permanently satisfied with what we have? Maybe never. Right? Maybe at some point you reach uh, a phase in your life where um, you finally become content, perhaps, but for many people, they never do. We could point to rich people, famous people, super driven achievers, and kind of point our finger at them as though they are the ones who have this seemingly insatiable desire for more, but we have to be honest that it's in all of us. It shows up in different ways and to different degrees. For some people, it's a desire to achieve. For others, it's a desire for adventure or excitement. And for some people, it's a desire for peace, quiet, less activity. But we rarely get whatever it is we're seeking. And when we do get it, it rarely lasts. Why? Some might say it's because it's just part of what it means to be human, to always be desiring more. It's just in us, and that's part of what drives us, and that's the way it's supposed to be. But I'm more inclined to agree with C.S. Lewis, who said famously, you may have heard this before, he said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. In other words, Lewis is saying the reason that we are rarely, if ever, satisfied in this life is because we were created for more than this life can give us. That's why people are always chasing more of something. There's nothing wrong with money or land or accomplishments or possessions or even seeking peace and quiet. The problem comes when we treat those things as though they are why we exist and that having them is what matters most. Or when we focus on those things to the neglect of the one thing that matters most. And we have a desire that none of those things can satisfy because they were never meant to. We're looking in all the wrong places. So who or what were we made for if not those things? Well, the answer is clear if we're willing to hear it. I invite you to join me in John chapter 6 once again, uh, picking up the story in verse 16. And Jesus' teaching in this passage is all about satisfaction. It's all about chasing satisfaction in the wrong things and how to sa find satisfaction in the one place that we were designed to get it. Now, in verse 16, John tells us a story that is familiar to us, right, of Jesus walking on the water. His disciples had been with him earlier when he fed the 5,000 and other very familiar story from Jesus' ministry. And for whatever reason, that evening, the disciples left on their own, got into a boat, and were crossing the sea. But Jesus was not with them. We're not told here in this instance why he wasn't with them. Perhaps he had gone to pray by himself, as he often did. Perhaps he was uh, sort of finishing up ministering to the people who were there. We don't know. But for whatever reason, the disciples got in the boat, they crossed the sea, and Jesus was not with them. And while they were crossing the sea, uh, John says in verse 18, that the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Now, if you've ever been on a lake when there's a strong wind and it becomes really, really rough, you know how precarious that can feel, even when you've got 
a gas-powered motor behind you that can help you get to the shore relatively quickly. These men didn't have that. They are apparently rowing. They just got paddles trying to fight these waves, trying to get out of this storm. It was no doubt a harrowing experience. And in the middle of that, when John says in verse 19, they had rowed about three or four miles. Think about how scared and exhausted they probably are by this point already. When they rode about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. They were probably already scared. Now they see Jesus where they did not expect to see any human being, right? And they are frightened by his appearance as he walks to them on the sea. Now, why is he doing this? Right? I mean, he's, it, obviously Jesus is not just sort of like strutting, like, <laughs> you guys have to paddle, and I can just walk. You know, that's, Jesus is not doing that. Why is he here? Why is he walking on the sea? What he is doing is the same kind of thing that God does in the Old Testament when he appears to Moses in the burning bush, for example. Or when he passes by Moses after he's hid him in the cleft of the rock. This is God showing up to show his people who he is. Because the Bible is really clear about who has power over the sea to this degree. There's only one person. And that's God. Job talks about this in Job chapter 9, verse 8, where he says uh, about God that who alone, that is God alone, stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. Who can trample the waves of the sea, Job asks? Only God. Only the creator of the sea can walk on the sea. What about Peter? Didn't Peter walk on the sea one time? Well, yeah, that's because Jesus called him to, and Jesus enabled him to, and even Peter didn't do it very well, right? Jesus had to save him. Only God has that kind of power over the sea. And when the disciples see him and they're terrified, verse 20 says, but he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. It's me. The I am. I'm here, Jesus says. Your God is here. I am your God in the flesh. I have power over the sea, so you don't need to fear. He's revealing himself. He's showing himself to be God with them. You might say, well, I thought we were supposed to fear God. Why does Jesus show up and say, don't be afraid? Aren't we supposed to fear God? We are supposed to fear God, but not in a cowering, terror-filled, frightened sense. We're supposed to fear God with a, a holy, reverent, awesome, in the sense of being filled with awe kind of fear. And that kind of fear also brings comfort when we know that God is near and that he's for us. The disciples know that Jesus loves them, Jesus cares about them, Jesus is for them. And so they ought to know that if Jesus has showed up with them, that everything is going to be okay for them. That's what he means by, don't be afraid. That's why Jesus assured his disciples and assures us at the end of the Gospel of Matthew that as we go into all the world and preach the Gospel, that he is with us always, even to the end of the age, so that no matter what we face, no matter where we go, no matter what comes up, that we have courage and confidence and peace because we know that Jesus is with us and Jesus is for us. So, Jesus comes to his disciples, then verse 21 says, then they were glad to take him into the boat. Once they realized, okay, it's really him, 
They're excited to have him in the boat, and it says immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now that could mean by the time Jesus walked to them, they had already made it almost all the way to the shore because they had gone that far, and that means Jesus had walked that far on this stormy sea. That would certainly be impressive. But I think what John is saying here is that they weren't close to the shore, but when Jesus got into the boat, all of a sudden, somehow they were. Supernaturally, they were transported right to where they intended to go. And on the next day, John says, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. So the, the crowd that Jesus had fed the day before, they're doing a little detective work. Hmm, where's Jesus? There was only one boat. Don't see his disciples. He wasn't with them though, and he's not here. Where is everybody? And so they get in other boats, and they uh, go to the other side of the sea as well. It says in verse 24, when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. They're looking for him. They want to find him. They want to be near him. Now that sounds like a good thing. If someone were to tell us that they were seeking Jesus or one of their neighbors was beginning to seek Jesus, we would say, well, that's great. That sounds really good. Jesus knows that the people are seeking him. When they find him, in verse 26, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me. He knows that they are pursuing him. They are after him. But there are right and wrong reasons to seek Jesus. We don't often think about that, but it's true. Jesus himself points this out. When they come to him in verse 25, they say, Rabbi, when did you come here? And he completely ignores the question. Right? That is not important. Here's what is important, Jesus says. Verse 26 again, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. In other words, Jesus says, you're seeking me for the wrong reasons. Should they have been seeking him because they saw signs? Yes. I think what Jesus means by saying that is, the signs that I'm doing, like feeding the 5,000, the signs that I'm doing as we've seen over and over again, the signs are meant to point people to Jesus and communicate who he is. Signs signify something, right? And so what Jesus is saying is, I know that you are not seeking me because you saw me do these signs and have come to realize through the signs who I am. You're not here because you realize I'm the Messiah and the Son of God and that I could give you eternal life. You're here because I gave you a free lunch and you would like another one. That's not a good reason to seek me. Still today, there are plenty of people who are seeking Jesus for the wrong reason. And there are people who make a lot of money encouraging people to seek Jesus for the wrong reason. People whose basic message is, if you will seek Jesus, he'll give you lots and lots of bread. Lots and lots of money, lots and lots of health, wealth, whatever. That's what Jesus is here for, to give you all that stuff. Jesus disagrees. Jesus disagrees. We are not meant to seek Jesus primarily to receive from him temporary provision, temporary blessings. Now, we do ask him for those things. Right? And that's not bad. Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. The, promise, the problem is not, hey, Jesus, can we have some bread? Right? There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when the people are not interested in what Jesus ultimately came to give, which is life, eternal life, knowing God, being reconciled to God through Jesus, knowing Jesus himself. They don't care about that, evidently. All they care about, it seems, is what Jesus can give them in terms of this life. 
That's the problem. They should be seeking him because they want eternal life, because they want to know God, because they recognize that Jesus is God's son. And as Jesus will say later in what we call his high priestly prayer in John 17, that knowing God is eternal life. That's what we were made for, to know God, to be in fellowship with God. That's what Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden that they lost because of their sin. That's what Jesus came to restore. We need to be forgiven so that we can be in fellowship with God. That's why Jesus died. That's why Jesus rose, so that everybody who comes to him in faith can receive that. But they're not seeking that. They're seeking Jesus, he says, because you ate your fill of the loaves. You just want more stuff from me. And that's a problem. So they say, well, actually, Jesus says, verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Now, Jesus is not saying quit your job, quit working so that you can put food on the table. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is you guys are spending your energy. You you probably hired out these boats to get over here to chase me down because the thing that you are pursuing more than anything else is perishable food, temporary food. Blessings. That's what you are, um, you know, almost wearing yourself out to get. Don't do that. Don't do that. Instead, work, labor for the food that endures to eternal life. Spend your energy, stir up in yourself a desire to seek what will last. What is eternal? What is permanent? Now again, he's not saying the temporary things don't matter or we can't ask for the temporary things. The problem is when we seek the temporary things instead of the permanent things, instead of the eternal things. When we seek the stuff that Jesus can give us instead of seeking Jesus. Now, the way he words this response prompts a question from those who are pursuing him in verse 28. It says, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? You just said we're working for the wrong things. So what kind of work does God want us to do? And Jesus answers them in verse 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Now that can sound a little confusing if we don't catch sort of the the word play that Jesus is using here. When they say, okay, what work are we supposed to do? What Jesus says is, okay, you want to know the work God wants you to do? It's actually not a work. He just wants you to believe. When he says, this is the work of God to believe him whom he has sent, What he means is, it's not about what work you do. The issue is whether or not you believe me, whether or not you trust me. That's what God cares about you doing. It's not as though faith is the one work we have to do to achieve righteousness or something like that. Faith is what God calls us to do instead of trying to work to be righteous. Because when we believe in Jesus, part of what we're doing is acknowledging, I can't do enough works to be righteous before God. The problem is not, in other words, that it's as though they are saying, okay, our works, our to-do list that we had, the things that we were trying to check off, you're, you seem to be telling us that that's not what you want us to do. So give us the right list. If I've got the wrong to-do list, give me the right to-do list and I'll do those things. And Jesus says, you don't need a to-do list. You don't need a list of works that you can check off and say, okay, I did what God wanted me to do. You know what God wants you to do? God wants you to trust me. 
God wants you to believe in me. God wants you to respond rightly to me, Jesus says. They appear to completely miss the point, which is not surprising. This happens all the time in the Gospels, right? When in verse 30 they said, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? How about the one he did yesterday? (laughs) How about the one that's the reason why you're chasing him down? It's not as though he hasn't done anything to show you this is who I am. This is why you should trust me. This is why you should believe in me. He's already done that. But they go on to say in verse 31, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. It's as though they say, hint, hint, we've got an idea of what you could do if you want us to believe in you. You know, that meal yesterday was really good, but you know how long Moses gave us bread in the wilderness? It was every day for 40 years. We could get started on that. Then maybe we believe you. Completely missing the point. The feeding of the 5,000 the day before, the multiplying the bread and the loaves, were meant to communicate to the people not that Jesus was a great place to get a free meal, but to communicate that Jesus is the one who can give life where nobody else can. He's he's not just like an all-you-can-eat sandwich shop owner. You know, I'm just giving out free food all the time. That's what I'm here for. That's not what he's here for. He's here to give something more lasting, more real, more substantial than bread. And all he calls us to do is to believe that he is who he says he is. So who is he? Verse 32, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. So first of all, let's let's get something straight about this story you're reminding me about, Jesus says. It wasn't Moses who gave your fathers that bread in the wilderness. It was God. Moses was just the one that was telling you about it. And explaining it to you because God would speak to Moses and then Moses would speak to the people. But Moses didn't create that bread. Moses didn't bring that bread down from heaven. The Father gave you that bread from heaven. And he is doing something like that again now. Here's what he's doing now. He also gives you the true bread from heaven. In other words, that bread from heaven in the past, that manna, That was just a sign. That was just a figure. That was something God did that pointed to something greater. And now that something greater is right in front of you. And you're missing it. You don't see it. Verse 33, he says, For the bread of God is He, a person. The bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The bread represents life. Right? We need, that's why Jesus teaches us to pray for daily bread. We need bread in order to sustain our life, in order for us to keep on living. But why does Jesus then, in a sense, compare himself to bread? Why does he talk about himself in terms of bread? Because we need him to talk to us in terms that we can understand and relate to. Okay, you know how you need bread every day in order to keep on living? Well, in a similar but even more significant way, you need me to have life at all. They said to him the same thing the Samaritan woman said to Jesus at the well when he told her that he could give her water that if she drank it, she would never thirst again. They say, sir, give us this bread always. That sounds great. Let's have some. And so Jesus says in verse 35, I'm talking about me. He says, I am 
the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. What does he mean by that? He doesn't mean that if you believe in him, you'll never need to eat lunch again, right? Or you never need a glass of water again. That's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is, if you come to me, I can give you life and I can satisfy your soul, your heart in a way that nothing else can so that you won't need anything else besides me. Now, if you eat a good sandwich today, you're going to need a good sandwich again tomorrow and the day after that. It's not going to satisfy you permanently. It's going to be temporary. But if you come to Jesus... You trust Him. You recognize He's the Son of God, that He's the Savior. You're not going to need to go find another Savior tomorrow or next week or next year. You're not going to have to chase after another person who can satisfy the longings of your soul. There's only one Creator, only one God that we were made for, and He can satisfy us as nothing else can. You chase after some kind of false God, some kind of created thing, hoping that it will satisfy your heart, after a while, when it lets you down and disappoints you, you'll try another one. Houses aren't enough. Cars aren't enough. Let's try boats. Let's try money. Let's try success at work. Let's try what? You're going to be trying something else all the time because none of it is going to work. But if you come to Jesus, it's not saying your life is going to be all of a sudden easy, or that it's never going to be hard, or you're never going to have questions or doubts or anything like that. But if you come to him, you will find in him the one that you were made for. The one who can do for you what no one else can. That's why Augustine said so famously about God, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Anything else that we try to seek rest in, it never gives us the rest that we're seeking. It never satisfies us the way that we hope that it will. It's not until our hearts finally come to rest in you, Lord, that we find true rest, true satisfaction. Because there are a thousand ways to try to seek true life and lasting satisfaction, but only one place you will ever find it. And that's in Jesus. Everything else we seek can only satisfy for a time. But Jesus satisfies forever with eternal life. And in him, we have all we need.